Good morning. This is the March 16, 2023 meeting of the Syracuse Regional Board of Review. This hearing is being held via video conference call on WebEx at the following location, Hughes State Office Building, 333 East Washington Street, Main Hearing Room, First Floor, Syracuse, New York, 13202. Time now is officially 942 and this hearing is open. The members of the board are to my right, Andrew Garlock, to my far left, Gail Swistek, and to my left, Jeffrey Hinderfelter, Hinderlater, excuse me. Uh, my name is C. Thomas Parsons, and from the Department of State, we have Thomas DiTulio. We will now hear the scheduled petitions. When you speak, please address the board with your name, title, legal address, so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. In making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on the matters referring to your exhibits to enable the court reporter to enter these into the record. <clears throat> In our first hearing this morning, we are going to be hearing the matter of the byway. This involves petitions number 2022-0350, 2022-0351, 2022-0383 and 2022-0385 and 2022-0391. And do we have the applicant requesting some amendment to the language here? Mr. Holden, you have your hand raised, go ahead. Hi, this is Jeffrey Holden, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Holden, H-O-L-D-E-N. Is that all the reporter needed? I'm sorry. Uh, what's Your address. Name? Oh, 11, the Byway, Ithaca. And our petition number was 2022-0379. Go ahead with your request, sir. Uh, so we got the um, response to our petition or the decision um, uh, back in December and uh, after our hearing, we were suggesting that the um, language be amended because we thought that while there was good understanding about um, the board's decision, that it um, the language, the way it was written and the way that our road and property are laid out, that it might be difficult to um, make practically enforce that. So um, I think the the decision's uh, pretty brief and to the point, uh, but it says today that there is a 12 foot fire department access road on the byway to be maintained along their property line. And it is the applicant's responsibility to manage parking and snow all storage along the byway such that a 12 foot fire department access road is maintained. <clears throat> I guess just to, um, recap what we see is the issue is that um, the 12 foot access for the fire department maintained along the property line. So the property line actually um, cuts in some places the road at a diagonal. Uh, and in some cases, the property, the road is completely inside of the property line. Um, and so we thought that that might cause confusion from a um, uh, an enforcement and um, understanding. Uh, so we had suggested that the language be changed um, uh, slightly uh, such that um, uh, this would be the language that a 12 foot proper, that, excuse me, let me restart, that a 12 foot fire department access road on the byway be maintained and it is the applicant's responsibility to manage parking and snow storage alongside their property such that a 12 foot fire department access road is maintained. Okay. When you say that your property line incurs, there's an incursion into the byway, uh, do you, are there legal easements established so the byway can cross your properties? I don't know the answer to your question. My wife, Mary Gardner is nodding yes. Could you speak, Maggie, or Mary, to that? Yes, my name is Mary Gardner, M-A-R-Y-G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E 
I live at 11 The Byway with Jeffrey Holden. And um, to help clarify, yes, I believe all the deeds. So the byway is a private road and all the deeds um, for the houses, residences along the byway include language about maintaining an easement for the byway. Um, but the byway, uh, as Jeffrey explained, cuts across some property lines, some portions of the byway are entirely within one property owner's um, property, other portions, the property lines extend halfway into the byway. Um, and so, and then there's other portions that appear to have at least some section of it isn't owned by anyone as far as we can tell. So it's a, it's a convoluted mix of property lines. And um, so the requested clarification would be that the property owner's responsibility is to ensure that there's a 12 foot road maintained um, and that their parking and snow removal alongside their property uh, enables that 12 foot maintenance to be uh, required, but but we're worried about including languages uh, uh, of 12 feet from the property line because that's um, even regardless of the parking situation that that doesn't legally describe the property along the byway. Okay. Um, so. Um, so the 12 foot access road may be accomplished irrespective of property lines by use of right of way easements, uh, access easements or drivable approach easements. Would that be a, would that additional language be uh, helpful? My suggestion would not be to add additional language, but to simplify the language that the board already used. Um, I mean, I think the idea is we want everyone to be working to maintain a 12 foot access along the byway as it exists and it already exists pursuant to easement. So I don't know if there's a need to include language about easement in the board's variance decisions. Well, I think by right, you know, byway um, does, if it does pass over private property would be by use of an easement. And, uh, if it isn't, then that 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 may be a complicating factor. So I'm just kind to, if I put this broad language in there, if we put this broad language in this, um, it may in, in, imply that it could be taken across somebody's land that doesn't have an easement. That that would be a problem that I don't want to get inserted into uh, some legal conflicts between neighbors if if it's not clear. Um, you know, whether there's an easement or not. So I guess that would be, I, see. I'm not, I don't want to be an attorney. I don't want to get into the legal aspects of it. So if there's access across the property, we will assume that there has to be some, some either right of way easement or, or, uh, uh, hold on one second here. May I, may I suggest sure. language for your consideration? Um, maybe defining the 12 foot Fire department access road at the beginning would be helpful. So to say something like a, a 12 foot fire department access road. According to existing easements. Be maintained on the byway. Or something, you know, putting in the reference to, I, I understand your point and putting in the reference to the existing easements as a way to help define. The fire access road. Yeah. Yeah, I would just just say that yeah, maybe, and we would. I just it would be an additional language, maybe in if amended to be accomplished irrespective of property lines by use of right of way easements, access easements, and drivable approach easements. I think those are the three types of easements that would pertain to this relationship you have. So I guess I'm, again, I, I'm not trying to sit there and I don't want us, our decision to apply to something that, that um, may, may have a legal issue that need to get sorted out. I understand your, what you're trying to achieve, but I'm also trying not to create an additional come back and have another conversation with attorneys. We're trying to stay out of that, that mess here. So not mess, but 
into that into that conversation. So we want to be very careful about what we what we say about this. Okay, um, let me go around the room here to see who else may want to have have a comment. All right, so let's pull. Who else would um, related to the byway case would like to speak on this matter? Anybody? Okay, don't see anybody speak up. You don't have any questions. Uh, let's go to the town code enforcement official. Mr. Mosley, you're here. Um, do you support this change in language? Yes, it would provide clarification to be able to understand and enforce appropriately. Again, my name is Marty Mosley. Sorry, I didn't announce that. I am the director of code enforcement for the town of Ithaca at 215 North Tioga Street. Ithaca, New York, 14850. Okay. So the code enforcement official will suggest, would the uh, language about easements, is that, would that be more helpful for you? Honestly, I don't think any of it would be helpful uh, just because of the nature of the private road and the complications associated with that, but the cross easements associated with the each property itself so we're just looking for a clear path forward for enforcement and moving right. forward in that capacity. Okay. All right. Questions from the board. All right. We're going to take about 5 minutes uh, in deliberation. Just to clarify our language and we'll be back. Okay. So we're going Off to recess record. for deliberation. We can. <laughs> Did you hear that, Maureen? They're off the record. Yes, we're, we're on the record. Okay, uh, returning re from recess, we're now going to uh, reconvene our case in the matter of petitions 2022 0350, 2022 0379, 2022 0383. 2022-0385 and 2022-0391. And the this involves the, the parties of Ann and Dana Mueller, Jeffrey Holden and Mary Gardner, Carolyn Levine, uh, Caroline Hubner, Tim Dogan Dugan, and Catherine Crawl. The chair would like to make the following motion to amend the petitions. The petition uh, pertains to a variance for allowing parking on a fire apparatus access road, which is a private road that is a loop connecting Forest Home Drive located in the town of Ithaca, County of Tompkins, New York State. The petitioner seeking relief from 19 NYCRR part 1225, the 2020 fire code section 503.4 obstructions of fire apparatus access roads, which states the fire apparatus access roads shall not be obstructed in any manner, including the parking of vehicles. The minimum widths and clearances established in sections 503.2.1 and 503.2.2 shall be maintained at all times. 503.2.1 dimensions fire apparatus access roads shall have an unobstructed width of not less than 20 feet. The petitioner is seeking relief for a variance to allow parking on fire apparatus access road, which is a private road that is loop connecting Forest Home Drive, reducing the driving lane to approximately 11 feet. The request for relief is in the result in two previous variances of 2021-0488 Mueller residents and 2021-0519 Holden Gardner residents. The lane dates to the 1780s and has been in continuous use. The posting of fire lane, no parking signs is required by New York State Fire Code Section 503.4. The residents have been parking along the lane since the interdiction of the automobile. Conversations with George Tamborell, the Q Heights Fire Department Chief, 
have stated that the department has been called to the in called to incident calls and that the department's set up apparatus on Forest Home Drive near the bridge and partially down the lane at the hilltop and attacks via hose lines and ladders when required. In the potential of findings of facts, subject petition pertains to single family residents on a private lane, which serves eight residences located at 11 the byway, the town and other addresses on in the town of Ithaca, County of Tompkins, New York State. Um, before I go on, do you have the other addresses, Mr. No, I did insert them in the decision. Okay. For the record, uh, there are uh, four other addresses that will be inserted. Four? Yes. Yes. Four of the addresses. On the byway, they'll be inserted related to the previous uh, variance. The proposed private lane subject to this petition has been properly classified for 19 NYCR Part 1225, Section 503.1.1, Fire Apparatus Access Roads, that for the past 60 years, the private lane has allowed parking of vehicles along its length without incident. The petitioners request clarification on the previous variances of where the 12 foot fire lane can be located and is their determined location and its determined location. The local code enforcement book, the local code official has been consulted in this matter and supports the changing of the language and granting of the variance under part 1205. Wherefore, strict compliance with the code would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, or would otherwise be unwarranted because such would create an excessive and unreasonable economic burden, would inhibit, inhibit achievement if some other important public policy would be physically or legally impracticable, would entail a change so slight as to produce negligible benefit consonant with the proposed, the purpose of the code. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance 19 NYCR 1225 section 503.4 be and is hereby proposed to be granted with the amendments and following conditions that a 12 foot fire department access road on the byway be maintained and it is the applicant's responsibility to manage parking and snow storage alongside their property such that a 12 foot fire department access road is maintained and that a 12 foot fire department access road on the byway may be accomplished irrespective of property lines by use of right of way easements, access easements or drivable approach easements. So, and I so move. I'll pull the board. Do I have a second on this motion? I second. Okay, and I'll pull the board. Mr. Garlock. Aye. Mr. Indelider. Aye. Ms. Swiss Deck. Aye. The chair votes aye. Four ayes, no nays. The amendment to the variances has been granted. <laughs> it should be pointed out this decision is limited to specific buildings and applications before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plan specifications presented in support of this application. This hearing is now concluded. Okay, next case. Before we move on, is there any questions from the applicants? Mr. Holden? No, thank you. Okay. Mr. Gardner, you spoke. Mr. Mosley? Yes, sir. Any questions? No questions currently, sir. Very good. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. We will now hear our second case. This hearing is in the matter of Oneida County Department of Aviation Petition Number 2023-0076. Let me get back to this case. Mm. 
the applicant is uh, Jess Plumley or JD Plumley Engineering PC, 8232 Hope Road, Baldwinsville, New York. And this is in regards to property located at uh, Building 101, Oneida County, Griffiths Airport, City of Rome, County of Oneida, State of New York. Petitioner seeking relief from 19 NYCR Part 1225, the Fire Code of New York State Sections 914.8.3. We have the applicant. Good morning, my name is Jesse Plumley, J E S S E P L U M L E Y, Plumley Engineering, located at 8232 Loop Road, Baldwinsville, New York, 13027. I'm here representing the United County Department of Aviation. Go ahead and uh... so currently the hangar, the hangars in building 101 use an AFFF system, which is aqueous form film forming foam um, for fire suppression in the hangars where airplanes are stored. Um, this AFFF uh, contains material known as PFAS, um, which is per or polyfluoroalkylated substances. Um, uh, they've been commonly known recently as forever chemicals. There's, uh, the DEC is currently in the process of banning them, their use and um, across the state and the country. Um, so the Oneida County Department of Aviation has to replace the system. The current um, NFPA code is that um, covers this is an, uh, NFPA 409. From 2016, that has been adopted in the uh, 2020 uh, New York Player Code of New York State. Um, they allow for um, a foam water deluge system, a combination of automatic sprinklers, and a low level uh, foam system, or a combination of automatic sprinklers and a high expansion foam system. Um, all of these systems use some type of of this foam that will very soon not be allowed in New York State. Um, so we are looking for relief from that with a separate system that is an um, ignitable liquid drainage floor assembly um, that is currently not allowed in the 409 from 2016, but is specifically allowed in the new updated version of NFPA 409-22, which has not been adopted by New York State Building Code, Fire Code. Okay. So the let's see. Is there anybody else here to speak on about this product or this system? No, nope, just you. Okay. Um, questions from the board. So you're going to install a new floor system. Yes, it's a system that goes over the existing concrete floor and uses a combination of um, water and um, very intricately designed flooring system that um, pulls the fuel away from the area and it removes one of the three points of the fire triangle, which is the fuel of a fire. So this system sets up underneath an aircraft or any any fuel system so that they're Fuels leaked. Yep, it's drawn in through this floor. Correct. Run out. So yep. you're not using the, the building's existing drains. You're building it. Correct. This has a whole system. system of drains um, okay. that would collect the water and oil mixture. Okay. And so, that is used in combination with the traditional overhead sprinkler for your more traditional fires. Okay. And this is a, a listed system. Yes. Yep. It's actually very specifically called out in the new 2022 standard. Okay. The so what yours? Well, who's it listed by? Is it an F? Who's, uh, who lists the system? Is it UL or who's who's done the testing? Oh, um, FM Global uh, NFPA has approved it. Okay. Yeah, um, it's uh, the New York, the U.S. military is currently installing it all over the country. Okay, all right. How many of these uh, in this? Is it just one hanger we talked about? Uh, three, three hangers. And, and so, does it? Is it has to be set up? For each individual type of airplane that's going to be set in there. Yeah. So, like, if you have three airplanes that are to be there, each airplane has to park on the system. Yeah. So, in this case, we are going to be covering a good portion of the floor so that there are many different orientations of airplanes. Um, the current 
planes that are um, planned to be in there are C5 galaxies, which are part of the large military aircraft. And so between those and they, they wanted to have a bit of flexibility about what they bring in. Okay. They want to cover a vast majority of the floor of each of the three. That was my next question. How do you prevent an airplane from extending off the system? Into, but it sounds like what you said is yeah, the whole floor. Is yeah, right? fairly much. Okay. Almost end to end. All right. Do they have to like take out the floor and just out of curiosity, do they have to take out the, the concrete to lower it? Or, there, nope. Or so it's like it? a, it's an aluminum uh, system. I want to look at this. I should have. Well, you, you'll have to leave it as 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 uh, an exhibit if you're going to leave it with us. Uh, maybe not then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's got pricing and stuff. And um, I don't. Know. Um, <laughs> so it's an aluminum. It's raised up about three four inches, um, and they will have to cut. Trenches in the concrete to get the water out when it does. Okay. Start. Okay. So you don't have to do anything about elevation. No, nope. actually, um, they require a slight slope in the floor of the existing floor, and the hanger has that already. So okay. That was hugely helpful. It was awesome. All right. Questions? Okay. Do we have a, is a local code enforcement official here to speak on it? Okay. I come come forward and speak at the. Your name, address, and your your role in this. Hi, I'm Scott Shane, S C O T T S H A N E. I work for the Department of State in Building Standards and Codes. I do direct enforcement for Oneida County. If they have opted out of doing their own county enforcement practices, um, and Griffiths is actually in my jurisdiction. Um, I'm not really familiar with the system as it is new and it's cutting edge. So my Concerns are if there is a spill, how is it disposed of? And I'm assuming there's some type of piping attached to it. And because it's not a yet completely accepted procedure, how would we perform the required testing on it? Does it fall back to manufacturers? Because it's not specifically prescribed in the code as we have it now. Um, I guess to be, in layman's terms, how am I going to know it's installed correctly? Because I get to do the testing on it or witness the testing. Is it going to be a third party? Uh, system of testing, etc. And does it increase or decrease the safety of the existing? I know the, the, the existing foam system can be toxic, hazardous to personnel. Uh, but the other concern is the, the control of fire. Does it give it at least the same amount of protection, or does it okay. increase the amount of protection? So that's the only questions that I would have. Do you have any response to? Yeah, um, so currently it's, um, I would say it's the same or greater amount of protection, uh, certainly uh, from an environmental standpoint, from a fire protection, um, it has been accepted by the military and NFPA. Um, it is in the, the currently published NFPA 20, NFPA 409-22, um, so it's just not been adopted by New York State yet. Um, in terms of draining and keeping the water separated from the environment, um, it is collected in trenches and it goes through an oil water separator. Our intentions are to discharge it to the city of Rome sanitary system. The water portion and then the, whatever fuels or oils are in there would be removed. Okay. So, do you know that there's any there's a, a acceptance testing procedures for this? Um, I believe SAFE still has an system in place to um, deliver and install and actually maintain this for many years. Um, there's this schedule of costs. Um, they do inspect and maintenance for, um, I believe, the first 10 years after installation. And they've analyzed it for they've included a cost down now this year for 50 years. Okay. Um, so there's two questions I have for Mr. Shane. Does the state of New York have a fire protection engineer on staff that can review the installation standards for this to and verify it's installed properly? To my knowledge, not within the division of building standards and codes, uh, okay. but I do believe that uh, it's possible. That Why don't you come up just to make sure? I'm sorry. Sorry, but make sure Maureen can hear you. 
Sorry about that. Uh, and to, to my knowledge, in the Division of Building Standards and Codes, we don't have our own fire protection engineer. Um, but I believe there might be the possibility for con consultation with the uh, Office of Fire Prevention Homeland Security. I know they do have some fire protection engineers on staff, but I don't know if they are able or willing to uh, verify uh, procedures on the system. Okay. I would have to, I would have to ask. All right, third, par third party review from a, would that be acceptable to the state for? If, if they were, uh, if they were adequately qualified third party uh, inspector, I would have no problems with that. Okay. Do it as a special inspection. If you exactly. Do you have any, if you had a special inspector or a third party FPE, do a review of it. Do you yeah. have any issues with the county to incur additional costs? No, on that. Okay. All right. That may, that's, I think based on Mr. Shane's testimony, that may be what we'll, we'll look at mm -hmm. as far as our decision. Okay. Any questions from the board? What happens with the fuel after everything's separated? Um, so once it's, um, it's evacuated from the building, it goes through an oil water separator um, that separates the fuels from the water. The water will get discharged to the, um, City sanitary and the fuel would be removed and disposed of properly by an environmental um, uh, contractor for disposal. Very similar to what a grease trap at a restaurant, same kind of idea. It's oh, cleaned out once in a yeah. while and disposed of properly. So the containment has to be large enough to hold the fuel at a C5 Galaxy, for instance, with gravity. So it actually yep. has to be sized for the aircraft. Yep. So, because it's rapidly evacuated and pumped out, and it goes into a store into a frac tank. Frac tank. So that's so it's got to be a large. Large. Yeah. Very large. It looks like the back of a tractor trailer. Okay. Of At least. It's a, yeah. fuel. it's a lot of fuel. Well, it's size. It is. It, it, these systems are sized for any one fuel containment vessel on the plane to burst. Okay. Um, or rupture, spill. Uh, not every drop. Of, they are designed specifically for one. Um, a lot of yeah, each one is a bladder or some kind of fuel cell. There's eight on a galaxy. Okay. And so if all eight one. failed, that that's not covered by this. So. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, I have two other questions if I may. Um, you know, I apologize mm -hmm. uh, not being familiar with this system. Uh, what comes to mind is with this type of system, is there any type of uh, Alarm a still alarm on it to notify the inhabitants of the building if a leak does occur and someone's not in the immediate area area while this plane is parked over the containment system. Uh, is there is this wired into the alarm system to notify them? Uh, and is the uh, the design going to include detailed vehicle impact protection for your storage tanks? I'm assuming it's going to be on the exterior of the building. It would be a big concern on an airport runway to make sure there's adequate vehicle impact protection. Um, yes, the, the tanks will be protected. Um, they can either be, we are still, um, assuming, um, this is allowed by this board. Um, we are still determining if they're going to be above ground storage tanks, or if we have room, we can put them below ground. So that that wouldn't be, um, an issue. What would the second board? Uh, the alarm. Yeah. yes, yes, this is, they had it there as flame detectors, um, and other. Systems in place to trigger the alarm system at the at the end. Okay. Thank you. In the case of no flames, it's just a spill. Is there there, yeah. Alert? Yes, assuming that discharge it, it, that triggers very good the alarm system. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, who was just talking? That was Mr. Plumley, and then Mr. Uh, uh, Shane, Shane spoke. Thank you. We'll chastise them later, Maureen. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> All right. We're going to go into recess right now so we can deliberate and we'll come back with you in about 10 minutes. We can We're off the record. record. Thank you. Thank you. We're back from recess. Uh, we will now continue.
in the matter of petition uh, 2023-0076, the matter Jesse Plumley for JD Plumley Engineering PC. Uh, do I have a motion? You do. Upon the application of Jesse Plumley for JD Plumley Engineering PC of 8232 Loop Road, Baldwinsville, New York, 13027, and upon taking testimony and hearing argument thereon, at a duly noticed hearing before the Capital Region Syracuse Board of Review, this hearing is being held via video conference um, at the following location, Hughes State Office Building 333 East Washington Street, first floor, room B, Syracuse, New York, 13202. And upon all other papers in this matter, the board makes the following determination. This petition pertains to replacing the existing fire suppression foam system material with an updated foam suppression material in lieu of the adopted reference standard located at Building 101, Oneida County Griffiths Airport, City of Rome, County of Oneida, State of New York. The public notice, the public notice was published in the March 1st, 2023 edition of the New York State Register. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the Fire Code of New York State, Section 914.8.3, which requires that aircraft hangars shall be provided with a fire suppression system designed in accordance with NFPA 409, based on the classification for the hangar given in Table 914.8.3 of NFPA 409-16. The petitioner requests relief to employ a more recent edition of the reference standard to NFPA 409-22 in lieu of NFPA 409-16. Based on the testimony and documentation presented, the board makes the following findings of fact. One, the subject building is known as Building 101, Oneida County Griffiths Airport, City of Rome, County of Oneida, State of New York. Two, the building that is the subject of this petition's main use is properly classified under 19 NYCRR Part 1221, Section 311.2, Moderate Hazard Storage, Group S-1. Storage Group S-1 occupancies are buildings occupied for storage uses that are not classified as Group S-2, including but not limited to the storage of the following aircraft hangar, storage, and repair. Three, the building that is the subject of this petition is properly classified under 19 NYCRR Part 1221, Section 602.2, Type 1B, Fire Resistive Construction, are those types of construction in which the building elements listed in Table 601 are of non-combustible materials except as permitted in Section 603 and elsewhere in the code, one story in height, sprinkler building with a foam suppression system totaling approximately 500,000 square feet. Four, as shown in Exhibit A, the petitioner states that the owner requests that the existing foam suppression compound be replaced with a less hazardous compound as shown in Exhibit D, the New York State Fire Prevention Bulletin. Five, the petitioner proposes to replace the foam suppression system compound with the updated compound that is found in the 2022 edition of the reference standard NFPA 409. Six, the petitioner has included NFPA 409-22, chapter eight, section 8.1.1, which identifies the compound and method for application and use. Seven, New York State Department of Division of uh, Department of State Division of Building Standards and Codes is the authority having jurisdiction for the County of Oneida, and the code enforcement official is not opposed to the variance. In view of the above findings, testimony, and documentation presented before it, the board finds that strict compliance with the code would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, or would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be unnecessary in light of the alternatives which, without a loss in the level of safety, achieve the intended objective of the code. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from 19 NYCRR Part 1225, Section 914.8.3 be granted with the condition that an independent review of the design, 
and special inspection of the installation shall be performed by a third party professional engineer with experience in the design, installation, and commissioning of these systems and approved by the code official. Furthermore, it is determined that the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the Uniform Code's provision for health, safety, and security. It should be noted that the decision of the board is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this application. I so move. I have a second. I'll second. Mr. Garlock seconds to hold the board. Mr. Lestek. Aye. Mr. Garlock. Aye. Stand your later. Aye. Chair votes aye, four ayes, no nays. Condition is granted. With conditions. Thank you. Any questions from the applicant? I actually do have one if you don't mind. Um, um, with this variance, which I appreciate your consideration, um, I would like to understand if we are locked into this method of fire prevention. If something else comes along or we decide to go to a, um, a fire prevention method that exists in the code today, can we do that? This was applied to a change. You want to be able to use this other option. We're allowing you to use this new option in NFPA 20.1. Yeah. 409 the, the new addition, we're allowing you to use it, but to use it, you have to do it with those conditions. So right. you can. Okay. Not locked into it. If you okay. want to do a co compliant method, that's all I wanted to check on. <laughs> yeah, if there's a new system. You'll well, have, have, yeah, it's not if there's something new that's not covered in the code, right? Yes, yeah, that I have to come back here. But, but if you're going to anything that's existing, yes, correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's move on to our next case. We'll now hear our next case, which is in the matter of petition 2023-008. Party is uh, Susan Terwilliger and Michael Oslewski. Oslewski, right? <laughs> Mispronounced it, please help me. No, that's Oshevsky. <laughs> Oshevsky, okay. Yeah. Michael Oshevsky. All right. Petition is uh, petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCR part 1220. The residential building code section 2602.1. Okay, let's see. So we have the application. The applicants, if you would state your name and your address individually, and then you can go ahead and state your case. Good morning, uh, Susan Terwilliger. Uh, we currently reside at 620 Elm Street Extension in Ithaca. Yes, and Michael Olszewski as well, 620 Elm Street Extension, Ithaca. Um, so we, uh, I, I sent a new narrative as of yesterday, but I'm just gonna read from it because I realize you all might not have this and I'm gonna try to condense it a bit because uh, there's a lot of material here. So initially we wanted to connect to the municipal water system, it's required. Um, and then we started having um, last summer, a nightmare just trying to get contractors even to give us estimates. And the estimates we got were uh, that we were able to get, some people just walked away and didn't even wanna do it. Um, and we got some very high numbers. So then um, I thought, I started to dig around about doing a well and realized that we we're we had to get a variance for that. Um, and uh, I did include exhibit, um, let's see, I think it's exhibit C, shows the list of the contractors that Bolton Point, our local water supplier, had recommended as having had a positive experience with. And I, I sent that because I just wanted to make it clear to the board, we have really been working hard on this, trying to be compliant. Um, and a lot of several contractors didn't even want the job. They came and looked, didn't want it. Another quoted like $30,000 just to run the, uh, let me back up a little. The, um, 
the property we live in now is on a well. The water source, municipal water source, is at the end of our long driveway um, across Elm Street on the opposite side. We purchased a property next to, adjoining to, our current property on the long driveway. Um, and that property is about 750, 800 feet to the municipal water supply. And it's an uphill run from the, uh, the connecting point. Um, so um, the, we, there's two quotes I had sent. One is kind of hard to understand because in relation to this project, because originally we were thinking, well, if we're gonna do it, we'll just hook up both houses. Um, and he didn't, but that quote, to hook up both, just to run the pipe up as far as our current house and hook up that house and install two meter pits. He gave us an estimate of over $30,000. Um, then we did get recently, and that's exhibit, um, exhibit A. We did recently manage to get another um, actual uh, estimate and that is um, exhibit A1, which you might not have, because that I sent just yesterday. And I'd be happy to screen share if you want to see it. It's um, just exclusively to hook up to uh, the 622 property, the new property. Um, and that is $21,646. Um, and um, so we were kind of upset about these costs and that made me kind of dig a little deeper into the whole thing um, i spoke with jeff hall who's the bolton point municipal water supply contact person he also told us we're also going to need water pressure booster pumps and i have an email from him um you know confirming that fact um and we're researching the cost of those it's anywhere from 750 to two thousand dollars uh, we currently have a well where we live now. We've never run out of water. It's never even slowed since it was drilled in 1954. And we can drill a well at 622 Elm for less than 10,000, which is exhibit B. I have an estimate there from a local well driller, driller um, which would save us probably potentially at least $15,000. But as I dug into this deeper, I also became concerned about some safety issues um, one is that I don't know exactly the purpose of the requirement of, of hooking to municipal, but it occurred to me one of it might be question of contam potential camp contamination of water supply from sewer. So especially um, if people have um, septics, but the previous owner of that lot had run a sewer line to the northeast corner of the property and we've applied and received an external plumbing permit. Um, and we have our, our planned line, that's exhibit D, to uh, connect to the municipal sewer. So we don't have that risk of contamination. Um, I also found out there's some issues for the municipal water supply for myself regarding chemicals. Um, and there's a organization called the Environmental Working Group um, and there, there's testing, they're a well-respected research and advocacy group working for public health. And there's a test from them that shows haloacetic acids, which are byproducts of chemical disinfectant, um, including chlorine, which is used by Bolton Point in the town's water level at a level of 38.1 parts per billion. Now, EWG rates this as 630 times their recommended health guideline of 0 0.06 parts per billion. Um, ex exhibit E shows that report by Environmental Working Group. Um, exhibit F shows the point at which chlorine is added in by Bolton Point. Um, and HAAs are recognized as being inherently detrimental to health. Um, 
and I attached exhibit G for that. And the municipal water is currently within the legal guidelines, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee safety, nor does it take into account individuals with sensitivities. And I have had problems with chlorine. Um, I don't swim in chlorine pools. I understand they're much higher level of chlorine, um, but also we had to have the pump replaced on our well about eight or nine years ago at, in 620. And at that time, the driller asked if we wanted to chlorinate. And I said, no, I we because I did not want the chlorination because I knew I had problems with it. Um, and currently we, we have very good water in the well. We have no problems with it in terms of our skin or anything like that. We do purchase um, uh, filtered and um, ultraviolet light disinfected water to, for drinking, um, but that that has worked out well for us. Um, and I'm expecting that if we connect to the municipal water supply because of the chlorine and other chemicals, um, we'll either have to continue purchasing our drinking water or we would need to undergo the expense of installing a full house water treatment system that uses filtering and ultraviolet light to treat the municipal uh, um, water because um, that's supposed to be the best way to re remove some of those chemicals. Um, and Lastly, there is one other um, thing I'd like you to take into consideration. Um, there are several mature trees that line our driveway that will be negatively impacted by digging a trench. Um, exhibit H, which again, if you don't have, I'm happy to share the share screen with you. Um, three photos taken starting at Elm and going north up the driveway about 350, 400 feet. And again, that's only half the distance to our new build. That's roughly the distance to our current house. And we're mostly concerned, we're concerned about all the trees in the right hand side of the first two photos. But the last photo shows trees we're most concerned about as they're on opposite sides of the driveway. So no matter which side we put the trench on, um, there'll be an impact. So in closing, due to issues with chlorine and other chemicals in the water, the impact on the mature trees, trees um, and plus what we feel is an excessive financial burden, um, we would like to be granted a variance and allowed to dig a, a well at the 622 Elm for our new house build. Are there any of those exhibits that you don't have that you would like me to share screen and show you or? What's it? What? It's just one minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Please. Just one more, just one moment, please. We're just verifying that we got all your, that, that the new exhibits were sent. Just give me one moment to make sure we did you get them, Gail? Yeah. Thank you. I apologize, it was so last minute. It was yesterday. I was trying to get another estimate for you, but we couldn't get one in time. <clears throat> I went to my work. You did. I didn't go in. I believe it's just a photograph. Yeah, there's four attachments. Exhibit one A, exhibit two, mature tree picture, and an updated narrative. It came from Utah. Yeah. What time? 9.23, sure. Okay, there we go. Bear with us one moment. We're just trying to get uh, the additional files you sent us. Okay. 
Sure. Attachments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I, looking through some of the exhibits we had, and we are actually get, receiving the new exhibits you sent, I have not seen any water test data that's shown that the Bolton Point water is unsafe or doesn't meet the stand. You know, the, Drinking water standards? Um, the Bolton Point water meets New York State drinking water standards. Okay. Um, the Exhibit E um, is from a, a site environmental working group. I don't know if you've heard of them. They are a public safety. Um, they're very well known and respected um, research group. They, they publish every year. Um, lists of things like if you're what vegetables have the most um uh, uh pesticides so if you were going to buy organic you would only buy maybe these vegetables or fruits you know if you were trying to budget um and they they have a water testing um database and exhibit e is the um ithaca town water and it does um have uh, the, the haloacetic acids, HAA9. Now, again, their health guidelines are considerably more strict than what is legal. But again, this doesn't necessarily take into consideration people who might have sensitivities like myself. Um, and these are the, the haloacetic acids are byproducts of chlorine. Um, and the um, the chlorine is in the exhibit F. It is added in post treatment chemical application by po Bolton Point. So um, there's there's the chlorine in the uh, there's chlorine in the um, if you have exhibit F. There's chlorine in step C in the Bol Bolton Point water treatment process which is as water flows in, they use chlorine to kill the bacteria. And then after filtration, after a number of other steps, they also add chlorine back in to guard it from bacteria as it is distributed. But again, this is not necessarily the best thing for someone who is chemically sensitive. Uh, so the there's a little confusion. One of your drawings, I think, shows a address of 622, uh, the water diagram showing full water line. It shows 520 as an existing house and 622 as a proposed house. Yeah, Six, the application is 620. 620 is our current residence. And okay. that is, we are on a well here and we've had wonderful, this, the well was drilled by my parents in 1954, prior to New York State's requirement to connect to municipal. I don't even know if municipal came up this, the hill this far in 1954. Um, and it actually only goes up the hill another, like maybe a third of a mile, if that, beyond us. So we are right at the edge of where, um, Ends. municipal ends um but the 622 is the property that we are seeking relief for because we're building a new house on that property 
and I have the the tax map lots um, <clears throat> are listed on there. These are both, so both of these are flagpole lots coming off of Elm Street. Um, and we were granted a, a variance by the town to build on the lot 622. Okay. I, I don't know if you're looking at the survey. I'm looking at water diagram. I just want to make sure I got clear. Okay, yeah. So, so the, the, yeah, there's. Yeah, the existing house, I can't tell whether it's 520 or 620, but I guess it's 620. 620, correct. Okay. Drawing was not clear for me. All right, I just wanted that for clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, questions from the board? This variance is just for 622. Correct. Would it be for this one? So we're grandfathered. Oh. Yeah, I, the the diagram shows a, a looks like you were connecting six twenty two, and again, I I apologize because I thought it said five twenty. It's six twenty. So that's why I was just trying to get some clarification where where that. Yes, and that that diagram, our thought was that if we do, if we have to connect to the municipal, then we would probably connect both houses because, you know, the only additional fee would be a permit for the separate property from Bolton Point and a, a separate uh, meter pit. Um, and, you know, a minimal, you know, the pipes will go in the same trench. Um, there'd be some additional cost for that. But um, again, now I'm not so eager to do that, knowing that, um, you know, we'd be committed to having chlorine in the water and then there would be is issues for me. And then, it, you know, we'd probably need a whole house uh, system to, um, with ultraviolet and filtering to be, try to, uh, eliminate those or m minimize those issues and one other <laughs> one other thing i just started looking into is with the booster pump i don't know how much pressure we would need um jeff hall said it's 50 psi at elm and it, it going un under the road through piping and then especially going up the long uphill the long driveway almost 800 feet um that we would definitely need significant boosting and i had a little bit of concern then about well if we're using hdpe pipe that's a plastic pipe if you're going to increase the pressure a lot are you running into a risk of possibly peeling off some chemicals or plat you know when you do that Copper has considerably less resistance than plastic, but it's like insanely expensive right now. So that's not even a, on the table for us to consider trying to do it with copper. As the current well, have you ever had the water tested just to confirm the water quality? Yes, home kits. Um, yes, we did do some home kits. Um, no, 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 but but no, um, but not through any, you know. Um, you see, certified lab. You haven't sent it to the Bolton Point lab or anything like that to be tested. No, we have not done that. We do have um, a water softener connected to this house, um, as the water in this whole area is somewhat. Um, uh hard it appears that it tested one point yeah but that was a long time ago i don't that know where it long. is yeah there her parents did a test a long time ago i, mean, I found the yeah. paperwork somewhere yeah but that was i don't know if that was a long time ago would a state verify it was um, but it was a long was. time ago yeah so i don't you know things yeah i understand his question is things can change so yeah well when you 
so it's likely that if, if the board were to grant a variance and you would have to um, install your new well, there's going to be a test required for the new well. And um, it, presumably you're going to be tapping the same aquifer, the, the same groundwater source. So is your, your current well, is it drilled, I take it? 50 feet. Yeah, it's only 50 feet and it's been uh, very productive. <laughs> There's actually a, a small spring on our new property. Um, so I, I, we're not gonna have any problems with water um, availability, I would, I would think. Mr. Garlock, do you have any questions? Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, what triggered uh, there's an existing house on 622. What's triggering 620 or 620? There's nothing on at 622. Uh, it's gonna is that a new house then? Or the new yeah. House? Yes, potentially an investment property where we're possibly we're gonna end up living there and selling this house. We have not completely, you know, but we had an opportunity to buy the house at the the land, excuse me, at an exceptional deal because we own the driveway. So the uh, property was essentially landlocked um, as because there was no access to road front from the property and that's a requirement of New York State. So um, we were able to purchase the property very reasonably and we created two flagpole lots by splitting the ownership of the driveway between the two properties that we own um, and created a new buildable lot. So it, it from our per point of view, it was an exceptional investment opportunity, whatever we decide to do with it. The diagram called, described as the water diagram shows parcels across the street from your house, I think it's to the west. Are those are there buildings on those parcels? Uh, yes, um, yes, there are buildings on all those par parcels. Yes. To the west. Oh wait, to the west. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes, both to the west and the east, there are buildings on those parcels. The the new property, the six twenty two that um. The uh, northernmost part of that property uh, is bounded by um, northern and and uh, westernmost parts of it is bounded by a town of Ithaca, a small park, a ten acre park, and walking trail. The the existing houses across the street from your current home are, do they have municipal water? The the actually well only the most recently built ones. Um a number of them have wells. This one has a well. No, he said across the street. I or or do you mean do you I'll, mean on Elms? Holland, Demakos, yes, Lemoyne, yes. Engelman and Driscoll. Some of them have wells, some of them have municipal, depending on when they were built. So they had to run a water line up that driveway to get to those houses. No, no, no. There, that those are on um, those all those lots to the what I would say east and west. Those have uh, town roads. Um, one is uh, Valley Hill, and the other one is West Haven, and that's where the municipal is coming out of. Right. So the town um, ran that line up so, there. Yeah. So our property is fairly isolated is what I'm saying between those two. We would have to catch the water way off of Elm Street. We have, we've been, just we an cannot, 800 foot dig. We cannot catch it off of uh, Valley View Road, which is the lots Holland, um, Lemoyne, Demakos. Those lots are on Valley View Road. The one at the end, which is Engelman and Driscoll, that is, they are definitely on a well. Um, and we can't catch the water from Valley View. The the Valley View lots, um, their water is on the west side of Valley View. So those lots you see there, Valley View Road is on the west side of that, and then their water is on the far side of that. But we've been told we cannot catch the water from there um, because we we'd have to run property. through their properties. 
And then Valley View Road is actually up a hill from your house, from your current house. Correct. Okay. And it's hard to tell from the elevate that on elevations or lack of elevations that your new home is still not as high as Valley View Road. Um, I guess it's about the same. It's, it's not. It's, it's, it is. It's not. Valley View is not that much higher from where we are now. It's a little bit, and our new home will be up the hill as well. But it's up a hill going north more. Um. Ms. Swistek, do you have any questions? No. Standard lighter, more questions? Mr. Garlock? Mr. Mosley? Yes, sir. Do you have an opinion or do you have any, any information for us to consider for this variance? I would say I'm looking at a topographic map that I have in front of me currently. Valley View is about 40 foot uphill as far as elevational difference than this property here. So the, the current property uh, 622 is about 40 foot drop from Valley View Drive, I believe. So just for that information, because I know you're asking about a differentiation there. Do you happen to know what the elevation is at Elm Street at the end of our driveway? It looks to be about nine. The elevation as far as topography is about 920. Valley View uh, is right around 950 to 960 at the intersection of Elm and Valley View Drive. And I suppose it's probably not possible to tell what the elevation of, of the, the new build site is. The elevation of the new build site is between it, it, the mid section of the property is about 960. Okay. Yeah. So we're in the we're, end, the end of Valley View Road, because it is a, uh, a turnaround, a dead end road that's a turnaround, is about a thousand as far as elevation goes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, that, so... That, that's the one question I'm trying to understand why you would, if Valley View is higher in elevation, why there is a need for booster pumps on this. We're not we cannot, from... we cannot connect to Valley View. That's what we've been told. We cannot there, connect to properties. Valley View. There's, there's properties. properties, the full length of Valley View, and we cannot run our water line through their properties. That's what we've been told. Uh, I'm not suggesting from... that. I'm just asking about water pressure at the Elm Street extension intersection. As um, compared to the end of Valley View and why you would need a pump to get to 622. So, I can only t I can only tell you what Jeff Hall from Bolton Point told me, and if you I I included his email as Exhibit um, C2. It was just one of the ones I sent last night. I I uh, yesterday afternoon. Again, I apologize. Um, so he I highlighted the um, the points. He said. Um, I was confirming with him that he said the water pressure on the opposite side of Elm is about 50 PSI and to run across the meter pit and up the driveway, we will need a booster pump to get adequate water pressure because the run is uphill and because plastic piping has a high friction value. So you lose a lot of pressure on a long run about um, it's about more like 800 than 850, but to 622. Am I understanding this correctly? And then he responded, yes, the water pressure is approximately 50 PSI and how you summed up our conversation is correct. So, I mean, he's the expert. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mosley, go ahead. I believe the what Mr. Hall is saying is that the elevation difference at the Elm Street connection point back to their yeah. private property is an uphill gradient and due to the length of pipe would then require a booster pump because of both those situations being combined okay i got i to the, the chairman's point is the the houses are higher at the next street up and if the water is fed so if the water main is on the elm street extension and feeds up that hill the water pressure will be lower by gradient the higher up you go in elevation the lower pressure you're going to have. And so if the houses on that, that town road don't have booster pumps, 
it's it's more the question of if that main on that town road is fed from the high ground to the low that's a different situation does that make sense it's it's a matter of elevation so the the distribution system if it's all being fed from the south to the north uh, the road properties it's just a, a question of um, if that makes sense or not when if that that street does not have booster pumps on those homes your property in essence is 80 feet lower at the driveway from the high point of that neighboring street that's you can just about put that at about 80 pounds difference so if there's only 50 they shouldn't have any water pressure at the end of that road does that make sense um i i all i can tell you is what this is sure. jeff, hall, jeff hall is the is the distribution manager manager at bolton point water system this is what he told me and that's why i included that email because yeah. i wanted him to confirm it with me also I do not know if the houses on Valley View use um, booster pumps. It might be they do. I really don't know. Okay. Hmm. Like I said, the ones that have that were built, um, that have been there longer, which is a, a, a fair number of those houses, are probably on wells. I don't know how many that is. Yeah, the town's water system. I understand that the purveyor is the the Bolton Point, they, they they produce the water, but the town is the distributor of the water. Correct. So and, and so I would be more reliant on the town's engineer's information about pressures and booster pumps than necessarily right. the, the, the processor of the water system. Mr. Hinderleiter, is a, he's an engineer with the city of uh, Oswego, so he's, he's very familiar with where I'm going with this. Yeah. So I guess one of the pieces that we're lacking here is an engineering analysis about, you know, the need for pumps and options for doing this uh, installation. So uh, again, we're just trying to understand the information you provided and mm -hmm. whether it's, it's valid or, or speculative. So, all right, um, any other, I don't think I have any other questions myself. Ms. Lynn Fulford, Ms. Swistak, anything? No. Mr. Garlet, speak later. Okay. And be, is there anybody else who'd like to speak in this matter other than the applicants and Mr. Mosley? Mr. Mosley, how do you do you support this variance? We don't have a position on the variance, honestly. Um, it's just the fact that they have to go through the process to request uh, in the event that the variance is granted. We have no opposition whether it's granted or not granted. So you don't oppose the variance? That would be correct. Thank you. All right. Hearing, uh, and I don't think we need any, we, we, we don't have any further information and uh, I think we've got everything we have. So we are going to go ahead and recess and uh, be about 15 minutes uh, for deliberation and we'll be back. Thank you. For the record. Thank you. We're on the record. Thank you. We are now going to uh, come out of a recess after deliberation and reopen uh, petition number 2023-0088. Uh, party of uh, Terwilliger and Olszewski. Uh, do I have a motion? We do. Ms. Swistak. The petition pertains to a variance for Susan Terwilliger and Michael Oshevsky, 620 Elm Street Extension, Ithaca, New York, concerning a single family residence, wood frame construction, 4,636 square feet, one story in height, located at 622 Elm Street Extension, town of Ithaca. County of Tompkins, New York State. The public notice was published in the New York State Register March 8th issue. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1220, the Residential Building Code Section 2602.1, which states, the water distribution system of any building or premises 
where plumbing fixtures are installed shall be connected to a public water supply. Where a public water supply system is not available or connection to the supply is not feasible, an individual water supply shall be provided. Individual water supplies shall be constructed and installed in accordance with the applicable state and local laws. The petitioner is seeking relief for a variance to drill a private well in lieu of connection to the public water system based on testimony and documentation presented. The board makes the fi follow following findings of fact. Subject petition pertains, number one, subject petition pertains to a single family residence, wood frame construction, 4,636 square feet, one story in height, located at 622 Elm Street Extension, Town of Ithaca, County of Tompkins, New York State. Number two, the subject petition pertains to requesting relief to allow Sorry. petitioner to drill private well in lieu of connecting to the public water system that is over 900 feet from the proposed residence location and on opposite sides of the road. Number three, the petitioner states that in their narrative, exhibit number three, that the previous landowner had run a sanitary sewer 500 feet up the leg of the flag building lot and the owner will extend and connect the proposed residence. Number four, the petitioner has provided estimates noting the expense of boring under the public road, exhibit number four, that the petitioner contends with the installation of the 900 feet of water service line connecting to the public water system far exceeds the cost of drilling a private well for domestic water. Number five, the petitioner states that the town of Ithaca had informed them that the New York State variants may be requested and provided procedures to obtain relief, but the petitioner will have to pay the monthly service fee. The local code official has been consulted in the matter and neither supports nor opposes the granting of the variance under part 1205. In view of the findings above findings, the board finds in the application before them that strict compliance with the code would be would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, or would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be unnecessary in light of all the things <laughs> which, without a loss in the level of safety, achieve the intended objective of the code, or would entail a change so slight as to produce a negligible additional benefit consent with the purpose of the code. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from 19 NYC RR part 1220, the residential building code section 2602.1 be and is hereby proposed to be granted. I so move. Do I have a second? I second. Mr. Indelator seconds. Polls the board. Mr. Garlock. Aye. Mr. Indelator. Aye. Ms. Swistak. Aye. Chair votes aye. Four ayes, no nays. Variances. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, how do we get paperwork to work? Is, Confirmation. Is this something town. that we will receive the whatever we the need the, the paperwork on, we will receive in the mail? Is that how that works? Yeah, just um, one more thing. Um, this decision that is that, we, that was just made is limited to the specific building and application before it. 
and as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of the application. So uh, the decision will be mailed to you probably within three to four weeks. Three to four weeks. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Thank guys. you. We really appreciate it. Have, Have a, a good, good day. day. Bye. <laughs> All right, next petition. What's that? Right, I have Myers Development Group. Right. Petition So do we know if it's it's been inspected by them. It's been used a long period of time. Okay. Structurally sound and structurally sound, yes. Typically fire escapes are not combustible. That's why I asked the question. And the reason comparison is that being constructed of wood, it doesn't meet the requirements. Multiple residency law is not combustible stairs. Nor does the other exits on the other side that come on the second floor. I see that. Under Is there a floor plan included in with us? No. Conversations with George Foster and Fire Marshal. I can say that there's an interior fire interior corridor that serves all three floors. And the third floor is the third floor studio apartment. Second floor is a three bedroom, and the first floor is a three bedroom. Really big building. Sure is. Interior rig. Yeah. I can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're reviewing new information. <laughs> yeah, All right. from the fire marshal. Yeah, we received additional documentation from the fire marshal regarding the third floor fire escape. Or the wood escapes. Should we open hearing? Oh, In the to... case, yeah, the hearing's open. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're not legally existing. For the requirements and the fault as well. No, they would be. So, even if constructed before the you know, original for the building. Correct. Yeah. If they were converted not before 1952, they would. If they were on or after 1952, they wouldn't be legal either because that's when local residence law takes effect, which requires all your second means of egress 
would be on fire, a lot of fire escape, but it has to be knocked above the construction. Let me just see. Do we, we don't have the fire marshal here. Unfortunately, they wiped out my phone. No, okay. And the fire marshal is uh, okay with this variance? He's okay with this variance. He just wanted to make sure we had uh, a ladder to it. To make sure that was a ladder to it. It comes off the third, the third floor porch going down. That wasn't included originally. So he wants a, a he wants to have a, a ladder installed on this. It's no, there. It's there already. He wanted to make sure it was good. Right, yes. right. I see the metal ladder. I what I more just wanted to make sure it's included yeah. because it's not allowed. Yeah, I'm more right. concerned about the wood fire escape. He yeah. doesn't seem too concerned about the wood fire escape. I am because well, it sits right below a window. Win a, a window is underneath that. So if there's a fire in that unit. It can't burn out the stairs. It's going to burn out those fire escape stairs. I, and looking at that, that upper platform, there's no interior railing in the stairwell area. And so you come out on that platform, and if you happen to walk to the left of this picture, you could fall literally. into the stairs, literally almost yeah. fall an entire story. <laughs> Yeah. Is he asking for a variance on the on well, the I stairs? Well, yeah, on this the area because it stairs, doesn't yeah. have the spindles. Same with coming down, there's no spindles. Bigger ass than just the ceiling. And the, yeah. the rail <laughs> comes down, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, you want to Mr. Parsons, excuse me. Do you I'm want so to be sorry. on the record? Oh yes. Okay. We never we never it's got off the record. It's going to be a little difficult. No, we're on, but it's just a little difficult with everybody. Talking. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we're still we're talking about this the next case. So if you wish to adjourn this. I I I think an adjournment to have a discussion with the property owner and the fire marshal on is in order. I I there's yeah. too many questions to grant this. Yeah, or I, deny it. I think the fire escape is a red flag for me. I mean, since it moved so dramatically from the scene. <laughs> so I would, if I can, you can move make. I'll make a motion to adjourn this case. I second. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn this case to a later date so that we can have representatives of the owner and the fire marshal to attend. Um, <clears throat> do I? So we. And lighter made the motion in regards to dish number 2023-0096 in the matters of Anthony Myers of Myers Development Group LLC uh, regarding a property located at uh, 1614 Sunset Avenue, City of Utica County of Oneida, State of New York. And Ms. Swistak is second. Hold the board, Mr. Garlock. Aye. Swistak. Aye. Mr. Andrew Leiter. Aye. Four eyes, no nays. Uh, this case is adjourned to a later date, um, waiting representation from the owner and the fire marshal's office. Okay, we're going to move on to our next case, Maureen. Okay. All right. Next case is in the matter of Premier Properties Holding MB LLC petition number 2022-0666. And this is an MRL as well, Mr. DeTulio? Yes, it is. Okay, let's take a look at the application. And this is in the matter of rep. Wojcicki of Premier Properties Holdings, MB LLC, regarding a property located at 27 Shepherd Place, City of Utica, County of Oneida, State of New York, and looking for a variance to the MRL, Chapter 61B, Sections, let's see, Article 3, Section 30, and Article 3, Section 31. Would somebody like to make a motion on this? Okay. 
Mr. Garlock will, is going to make the motion and read it into the record. With respect to petition of Brett Lajewski of Premier Property Holdings, MV LLC, petition number 2022 0666, um, address uh, property located at 147 Genesee Street, New Hartford, New York, filed for student to 19. NYCRR 1205 on December 10th, 2022. And upon all other papers in this matter, the department makes the following determination. Petition pertains to an existing apartment building with four dwelling units, two stories with an occupied attic, wood frame type 5B combustible construction located at 27 Shepherd Place, City of Utica, County of Orange, State of New York. Relief is requested from Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York, Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 30, Cellar Ceilings. Cellar Ceilings. In every such dwelling, three stories or more in height, the ceiling of the cellar or the lowest story, if there be no cellar, shall be fire retarded or equipped with a sprinkler system unless such ceiling has already been plastered to the satisfaction of the department. Petitioner requests relief and the requirements for fire rating the cellar ceiling. Relief is also requested from Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York, Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 31, Inside Cellar Stairs, which requires that every stair leading from a cellar to a floor above in all old multiple dwellings shall be enclosed with fire retarded partitions, and shall be equipped with a fire retarded self-closing door located as the department may approve. The fire inspection report states that the basement of stairwell shall be fireproof according to the code. <clears throat> the board makes the following findings. The building that is the subject of this petition is a three-story wood frame multifamily residence. The building consists of three dwelling units and is located at 27 Shepherd Place, City of Utica, Oneida County, State of New York. Two, the building that is the subject of this petition is properly classified under Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York, Multiple Residence Law, Article 1, Section 4, parentheses 33, as a multiple dwelling. <clears throat> Three, the subject building is required to conform to the provisions of Article 3 of the Multiple Residence Law as provided in Section 25 in that it existed on July 1st, 1952, or was converted to a multiple dwelling after July 1st, 1952, and is not a hotel or similar dwelling subject to Article 4 of the Multiple Residence Law. <clears throat> Four, New York State MRL Section 30 requires the lowest story ceiling be fire rated or protected by a sprinkler system. However, the existing building basement ceiling is not enclosed with fire retardant material nor protected with a sprinkler. A fire in the cellar could easily spread throughout the building if it's noticed. There is a mechanical system piping and electrical wiring along the ceiling of this unoccupied cellar, which would make installing a fire retardant ceiling very difficult. Five, the petitioner states that section 31 requires that the interior cellar stair to the basement require to be enclosed with a fire rated partitions and equipped with a fire retardant self-closing door located as the department, fire department approves. Six, the petitioner states that the first floor consists of a single apartment with two egress exits, and the second floor consists of an apartment accessed by two stairways, the front apartment accessible from a shared entrance with the first floor, with from a shared entrance with the first floor with the stair leading to the second floor front apartment and the occupied third floor. <clears throat> the proposed var variance will not substantially adversely affect the law's provision for health, safety, and security. Strict compliance would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, or would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be unnecessary in light of alternatives which, without a loss of level of safety, achieve the intended objective of the law. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 30 and 31, be and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. One, that at least two single smoke 
single station smoke alarm devices be provided in the cellar. Two, that a single station smoke alarm be provided on each landing of the exit stairway. Three, that a single station heat alarm be provided on the occupied side of one entrance door to the three dwelling units. Four, that all of the above noted smoke and heat alarms shall be interconnected together, either hardwired or be wireless interconnected devices. Five, that all wood apartment doors be equipped with self-closing devices or self-closing hinges. <clears throat> and six, that the basement door leading to the cellar or basement stairs shall be replaced with a C-label fire rated door with closure or apply intumescent paint to meet a UL rating of a 45 minute door with closure. This, this decision is limited to specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give, to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this application. I so move. We have a motion by Mr. Garlick. Do we have a second? Uh, second. Mr. Leiter seconds. Pull the board. Ms. Swistak? Aye. Mr. Leiter? Aye. Mr. Garlock? Aye. Chair votes aye. Four A's. Four eyes. No nays. Petition is granted. We're going to take a, mo a brief recess, Maureen. Be right back. Thank you. We're on, We're on the record. Okay. Uh, the board's back in session. Uh, the members of the board currently are Andrew Garlock, Jeffrey Hinderleiter, and my name is C. Thomas Parsons. Gail Smith has recused herself in the next case uh, in the matter of Travis Tomey, edition number 20230095. Ms. Swistak is no longer at the meeting and has left the room. And let's grab the petition here. All right, and this matter is seeking release relief uh, for a prefabricated carport metal tube frame structure with metal roof, one story in height, located at 134 Merritt Avenue, City of Syracuse, County of Onondaga, New York State. Um, it's in regards to the residential code, section 301.2, parenthesis six, which states. 301.2 climate geographic design criteria buildings shall be constructed in accordance with the provisions of this code as limited by the provisions of this section. Additional criteria shall be established by the local jurisdiction and set forth in table R301.2 parentheses one table R301.2 parentheses one requires a design ground snow load found in table 301.6, which illustrates the city of Syracuse ground snow load is 50 pounds per square foot. All right, do we have, we have the uh, petitioner here? Do we have, yep. State your name and your address, sir. Travis Tumi, T W O M E Y, one three two, one three four, excuse me, one three four Merritt Ave, Syracuse, one three two zero seven. Mr. Tolman, you're going to have to speak up a little louder. Hang on, I used to coach sports. Hang on to your ears. So tell us about what you're requesting here and how 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 you came before us. Uh, I got a uh, wood violation report from the city that I needed to have a permit. I was unaware, so I began the process of getting a permit. Went down to the permit office, and they told me about the 35 versus 50 square feet. And so that led me to request a variant. 
Yeah, that's why I'm there today. Did you, you, so you did not have a building permit when you installed this? No, I just had no idea I needed it. It was a kit I bought online and put it together. It didn't touch the house, and that was my understanding of the permit. If it touched the dwelling, that I would need a permit, but it did not. It was 10 feet from the dwelling, so I didn't think I needed one. How much did you spend for this uh, carport? Uh, $1,700. And how much is the, uh, how much would it cost to, to buy a new one that's strong enough to hold the snow load? I, I don't know. The, the company that made that one doesn't make them any stronger. Okay. My resolution uh, provided some more photos yesterday. My resolution is to get out there and just clean the snow off while it's falling if necessary to make sure it doesn't build up on the thing. And I sent a couple of pictures of, of how I did that. Got the tools, got the ability, got a grandson, and I lose the ability that can do it. So that's, that's my request is to just let me take care of the snow load on the I'll keep it scraped off so it doesn't build up on it. Is there only one dwelling unit in your home? Is it just you living there or do you have an apartment uh, or other people that live there that are not related to you? I live alone. My grandson, it is about, about a block away, but the backyards connect. Really only have to walk through the backyard to get there. So you don't have you don't have an accessory dwelling unit or another apartment in your house and somebody else lives there. Is that correct? No. I do not. Okay. All right. Uh, just let me ask any questions from the board members. Mr. Garlock? Uh, Mr. Hinderlater, do you have any questions? So the the manufacturer by your submittal stated that the the carport that you purchased has a, a rated load of 35 pounds per square foot. Is that correct? Yes. And they do not offer any bracing or otherwise reinforcing kits to get it to 50 pounds per square foot. No. Okay. Go ahead. I see um, there's a picture provided in the it's part of the submittal package um, of a carport that has a snow kit. It, it, it's called a snow kit provided by a manufacturer or a professional engineer. Is this just an example of uh, that? This wasn't submitted I, by the applicant. No, I provided to him saying this is. Yeah. Done previously. Right. There's there's a there's a, another additional email sent. Yeah, which has got a picture of the carport with his car parked underneath it. Don't worry about the tree limbs. <laughs> and the petitioner has tried to get an engineer or architect. Give a design solution to it, but he's been unsuccessful on that. Okay. I think we're going to need a camera for. He could step in. Yeah. I have him say here, you could turn that camera a little bit. Okay. We have a uh, code enforcement official, Lynch. Come on. I zoom out a little. You can probably grab that way. There you go. Do you want me to sit down? Yep. Yeah. Just state your name. Uh, Brian Thompson, City of Syracuse. Do uh, you want address too? Yep. Uh, please. 201 East Washington Street, Syracuse, New York, 13202. Okay. Do you have anything you want to state about this? I, I don't really have any anything. I just uh, 
came in case you had questions. It, it appears that it was uh, a complaint came in on January 20th of 23. Um, an inspector was uh, sent out three days later, made the citation three days later when they visited the site on the on January 23rd. Uh, they, they issued the, the violation for construction without a permit. Okay. Um, they, he, the uh, owner did attempt to apply for a permit. Um, we never started an application because when he came in, we were able to identify that it beat the ground snow load. And I said, you know, I, I take your application and I'm just going to turn around and deny it for not meeting that. So did you deny it? We didn't start an application. I gave him that. I gave him the opportunity to come here first and, you know, either just kind of withdraw asking for the permit um, or if I it would have been instantly denied. Yeah, in the future, you should take the application because then you have grounds to issue, you know, notice of yeah. uh, dem When you have the application that actually, is, then we can act on it, but there's no application. We're acting on this violation, which is clearly it's a violation. Correct. But now we have to act on a variance, which he needs to have, submit a, a building permit to get the very, to, to yeah. get the bar variance, excuse me. So, um, do you have any, I, obviously the snow load issue, do you have any other opinions about this? I, I talked with uh, Chief Davis, um, who's not here today. Yeah. Um, I talked with uh, the Director of Code Enforcement, Jake Deshaw. It, it's a it's a tough one. I, I it's a, If you look at it, if it was in the building code, it would be a risk category one, which is obviously the lowest hazard category. It's a, you know, it's an accessory structure. It's, not really it, it's a loosely occupied structure you know he's going to be in it when he's getting in and out of his car i guess the only can you know concern outside of you know the codes realm is you know does his insurance company know well how does you know did, did, would that have an impact if he is parking a vehicle under it and you know it doesn't need it do they have issue but you know that's, that's kind of a lot of outside of what what we do so so one of the the things when you do snow load design in New York, you can use um, the roof snow load is different than the ground snow load. Usually, there's reduction factors that can occur. Has that calculation happened? Meaning, you have your ground snow load; it's 50. But once you actually do your roof design, uh, you based on roof material pitch, those things. Oftentimes, the actual structural design is going to be a lower number than that. It, yes, it, it can be. Um, yeah. Has that had? Do we know if that's happened? Not to my knowledge, no. It's not a very steep route, so no. Chances are, it's not going to be a very big reduction. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's more if if uh, if any analysis has actually been done, um, or if the manufacturer provided any. I mean, they're they're sort of sort of self-certifying 35 PSF um, as their design load, but if, you know, have they provided any other documentation, how they arrived at that? Would we see the numbers, right? Any questions, Mr. Thompson? How is it anchored down? I, I can't. I can't speak to that. Yeah. So we don't even know. We, we, the only like the only documentation there was was a you know basically the, the cut sheet from the manufacturer. Um, nothing else. Does it meet when you know if it's anchored properly? Does the structure meet the wind loading requirements? I or so, no. Any lateral load requirement? Obviously, it would have to be anchored in order to do that. I don't know how it's installed. I'm not the inspector that went and visited the site. Um, Mr. Kumi, can you speak to the um, the anchorage, how the carport is attached to the ground? I only to the extent that we follow the instructions there, it involves pinning it down dirt. What's holding it down, oh, sir? I don't remember much about that. Uh, 
that's way more concerning. So it's the yeah. Yeah. Pretty significant uplift. Without knowing if the the structures constructed for the manufacturer's documentation or it's anchored to the ground, it's hard to grab a variance for one when there may be other issues involved. Um, what's that? Both get addition. Yeah, I would. I think he really needs to submit a billing permit, and then you can do yeah. an inspection, yeah. find out all the issues with this. Okay. It, it would be nice to see um, after you guys evaluate the installation per manufacturer specifications, like if there are uh, what the bolting requirements are, are the connections put in the way that the manufacturer says, kind of have all that information so a full inspection is done on it to know. First, is it installed the way the manufacturer intended? Because these loads are going to be very dependent on that. So if there's a torque spec on on the connection, because this does not have the cross bracing of, of the other picture that we saw, which was like a double right. carport. There's no truss system in the roof. There's no corner bracing for lateral. So that must mean there's usually a, a corner piece in there that you're bulking through. So it's it's to kind of know some of those things. And um, and who's going to um, you have being the AHJ, uh, the authority having jurisdiction? Someone has to say that it at least was put together per the manufacturer's specifications. Uh, and so I, I think uh, permit in order, get that order in, and maybe issue a stop work order with that permit. You know, permit comes in, and then if something's out of compliance. Put it there until these things can happen, and and then. Yeah. Um, well, I can't. I can't issue the permit, so we'll take the application in. Right. Um, Just and you and then I'll, yeah. I'll send an inspector down. Yep. Document. Yeah, the permit. permit. Yeah. You have to take the permit, issue yep. the issues, issue issue the denial because of the specific issues. Yep. He can appeal that or ask the variance for what the, what a, the components he has. At the end of the day, you still have the. Chapter one violation, which the board really can't has no authority on dealing with the chapter one enforcement issues. That's it's just a matter of the code sections we can address. So that's kind of the where we're at. Um, yeah, I, I was under the impression today that he was just seeking relief for the ground snow load. Right, and that, but we have these other questions which sure. you have. Under there's no inspection. You'd have no, you know, that's where the documentation all that comes in. So. Mr. Tomey? Yes. What we're going to do is we're going to adjourn this case till next month or our next meeting. Um, what we've asked the building inspectors to do is meet with you to gather up information on the, the installation. First, you'll need to complete that building permit with, the, with all the documentation you have about the building. And to determine, other than the snow load, is it you know the install since it's already there, is it installed properly? Is it anchored to the ground properly? Um, those things. Um, I think if it, if it's just one issue, we can act on it. But I'm afraid that there may be other issues related to the structure that may make it you know an unsafe structure that uh, wouldn't necessarily get a variance for. It. Okay. So it's allowing. No, no. You know, to go through a process so we make sure all the items that may be deficient are are are, are uh, identified. And if it's only the snow load, then we can deal with the snow load. Is that okay? I'm still not sure what what the concern is. Is what I need to do to address it. Can you, Mr. Mr. Tulio, will be in contact with you and follow up. Yeah, Mr. Tomey, I, I can contact you after the meeting and explain to you what the process will be. Um, and I can go along with the billing department should they do an inspection and notify me ahead of time. So we can discuss what needs to be done, what the board has concerns with. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'll make a motion to adjourn this till next month or to the next meeting. I'll second. Okay.
uh, Mr. Garlock seconds. Um, and as a caveat to this is that um, if we hear nothing back, then there, then we're just going to deny the, the variance. If we hear nothing back from the applicants, we'll just go ahead and deny the variance. So there needs to be follow up. It just can't Absolutely. linger out. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, motion second. I'll pull the board, Mr. Hinderleiter. Aye. Mr. Parsons votes aye. Mr. Garlock. Okay, three ayes, no nays. This uh, petition is adjourned until uh, next month or the next uh, April twentieth 20, April, April 20th meeting hearing. Thank you. That's our last case for the day. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen. We can go off the record. Thank you. We're off the record. <laughs>